Hey everyone, welcome to another live recording of the Engadget Podcast. I'm senior editor Devendra Hardwar. I'm here with our reviews editor Sherlyn Lowe. Hey Sherlyn. Hello. Hello, and our podcast producer Ben Elman. Howdy, Ben. I'm looking forward to not being washed out because I'm finally getting blinds. This <laughs> ben week. is uh, just like every just fading into pure like yeah, yeah pure, crazy pure contrast and, right now, <laughs> and also terrible terrible aspect ratio. Oh boy, we yeah yeah. It's just every you're like the drill image in on twitter <laughs> and just like slowly okay so today we're gonna be talking about microsoft mesh that new thing they announced uh this week so go check out my coverage of that uh we as usual this is going to be the live stream we're going to start recording the podcast officially soon that's basically you're going to get to see how the podcast is made so we may make some errors and uh we can't chat with you as the live audience as we're recording but we'll do some q a sections in between our different segments okay and we've got a special guest too so stay tuned for that um are you guys good to go recording wise and video i'm looking at my audacity to make sure it's still going and it is mm -hmm. okay yeah we've we've had some recording fun times okay <clears throat> let's kick off in three two one what's up everyone and welcome back to the engadget podcast i'm senior editor devendra hardwar i'm reviews editor sherlyn lowe Today, we're going to be talking about the future of work, which is something we've heard a lot about this week uh, or this past year. But I think this week it gets even more interesting because Microsoft introduced something called Microsoft Mesh, which is sort of their view of a futuristic remote collaboration, virtual meetings, software. And to talk about that, we have a great guest on. But before we get there, just want to say thank you for listening to the Engadget podcast. Please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes. You can always email us at podcastandgadget.com. We may bring your questions into future episodes. So Microsoft Mesh, what the hell is this? To help yeah, us like, me, break please. it down. <laughs> well, first, let's bring in Scott Stein from CNET, uh, CNET editor at large, to chat about this. Scott, how are you doing? Hey, great. It's great to be here virtually. It's good, it's good to be on. <laughs> good to chat. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we always like to get people on from different corners of the tech world. Um, I want to ask you up front, Scott, I know you've done a lot of coverage around VR and mixed reality and AR. And, uh, you know, I followed your coverage for a while now. Can you give us like just a quick, quick setup? What is Microsoft Mesh exactly? Sure. So, this is like the promise I feel like of what HoloLens was was going to be, yep. and why it feels like a lot of in a lot of ways we've seen this before yet have we really? So it, it's really just a way for a lot of people to get together in one virtual space that agrees mm -hmm. with each other, and um, and and Microsoft's like umbrella for that is really large. Mm -hmm. Like the demos that we got to do, which we we'll talk about later, were on HoloLens and AR. The keynote was in VR through their alt space. VR social app that they acquired. And they also want to fold in all other VR headsets, uh, practically right. uh, phones that are running AR or not, <laughs> 2D screens. So it's kind of like imagining Microsoft Teams expanded into cartoons and virtual <laughs> things. Optionally, you could basically, it's the Marvel, it's this whole thing of like the Marvel holograms around the <laughs> table, sure. you know, where sure. they're trying to make that happen. And what, what are the uh, drawbacks and, and what are the magical possibilities of it? Yeah, and I think on a higher level, right, it is Microsoft Mesh is not a specific piece of software. It's not an app. It is a platform that Microsoft is going to let other people develop for. So I think the way they likened it to me, I was talking to uh, Greg Sullivan, their head of mixed reality uh, during my meeting last week. And um, it was basically like he said it was like Xbox Live. It was a way that Xbox Live kind of unified uh, game console multiplayer and connectivity. And th that may sound like boring work, but before the Xbox and certainly before the Xbox 360, getting a game console online, getting networking into games was really tough on the console level. Um, and Xbox Live kind of simplified that. It gave developers a way like, hey, this is how you do networking. This is how you do multiplayer. We have this whole thing set up. Just plug into this. So Mesh is this thing that, other developers can start using down the line to power their remote apps and do all sorts of things. Um, Scott, we've seen, both you and I, we've seen Spatial, right? The yes. virtual meeting software. How does that differ from what Microsoft is doing? Because I like Spatial. 
it was very cool. And they actually just recently opened it up and added like support for phones and computers too. But it seems a little more restrictive than this idea, this sort of like cross-platform, cross-device virtual meeting space that Microsoft is building. Well, I think that's exactly it. Like right now you're seeing a lot of companies, Spatial's definitely at the forefront, mm -hmm. reaching out to a lot of devices that Spatial works on. So Spatial in a similar way works with 2D uh, devices, works with Oculus Quest, HoloLens, they're, they're pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. But Spatial is one app, pretty much. So, you know, it's like they're folding in a lot of other work cloud services into it. And I'm sure Spatial, like a lot of other companies, may I'm, I'm guessing, would want to branch out even more. Exactly. So I think there are a lot of players in the space. But, but uh, what Microsoft is looking at is, is more, like you said, more of that framework. So I think that, that what they're looking at is not so much one meeting area, although that could be alt space VR or mm -hmm. future teams or whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, they, they had partners like Niantic uh, doing the Pokemon Go demo. You know, <laughs> they have their own world map strategy. So I think the idea is you, you hook in the service to that. So I think that's what's what makes it pretty different, mm -hmm. especially compared to, you know, I think the, one of the biggest VR players out there that's aiming for AR with Facebook, where, you know, the big question is, Facebook seems to want to be putting everything into Facebook's world, but how much is Facebook going to reach out? And Microsoft is making a big bid uh -huh. to reach out to everything else. It is sort of, it is the difference between Macs and PCs, right? And the way Windows powered multiple different types of hardware, multiple manufacturers and whatnot, Macs were just Apple. And it seems like we keep seeing that battle play out again and again. But uh, let's take a step back. Uh, we both previewed this stuff and uh, I assume you got that giant Pelican case from Microsoft last week too. Let's talk about that and what those meetings were like. So what did you get in your box? Right, so I mean, it's funny because like, there's a gigantic <laughs> box Huge. of stuff. This is like, thing about like trying to simulate a home virtual experience. So they, they, they sent this like loaner kit of this, of just gaming PC, a, a HP Reverb G2, which are stuff mm -hmm. I already, I had already. Yeah. But I yeah. think we're, we're already like, these were like specifically hooked into launch smoothly into the pre-build for, for all the stuff. But the really interesting thing for me was the HoloLens too, because to this point, Microsoft had never let the HoloLens 2 outside yeah. to anyone to, to play around with as far as I know. It's been with demos I've had. So that was, it's been, was really fun and interesting to see what it would be like in my home to use it. Mm -hmm. And the de and then from there, there was like a two part experience. One, which I wrote about is the, well, I wrote about both, but like one was really HoloLens based where Alex Kitman, a uh, technical fellow who's basically heading the, the mixed reality, larger picture, um, beamed in and, and connected with me. And I did a demo of him with him of mesh in my, my cluttered office. So what that looked like was, you know, cartoonish, like, you know, this, but very well pinned. So it was this table mm -hmm. that appeared and then he hovered in and we met and on his end, they did capture of what it looked like on his end with like nice capture equipment. But mm -hmm. the second part so was- He looked this, realistic, oh, yeah. right? Like that's the thing, like he looked photorealistic. Uh, I didn't have that meeting, but I saw like what he looked like during the keynote. He walks into this box, which is just surrounded by cameras, right? And it basically holoports him, uh, holoportation. Was the, yes. was the word Microsoft was trying to kind of convey to us. But yeah, he steps inside this box, he gets projected into this experience and you can see his full 3D self and he's just standing in your room as a hologram basically, right? So what's interesting is that that realistic part did not happen in my demo. So it's like oh, two okay. different levels. He okay. appeared as the as the cartoon, you know? And, yep. and that was, you saw this on the keynote, if you watch the Altspace VR or if you see it online. Um, if you've been in Altspace VR, where you have basically these cartoon avatars. It's like, you know, also Oculus has them. There's a lot of these things because you can't scan your body in easily. Mm -hmm. So he appeared as that. And then, so it was really just cartoon Alex Kitman. <laughs> and then <laughs> hovering without, you know, without, without legs. And then to him, I, I created an avatar for myself, which looked mm -hmm. ridiculous, like cartoon sort of, sort of me. <laughs> and then we, we didn't actually see the real selves. But what he was showing on stage, like you said, is a very interesting like kind of next stage move that they're they're exploring, which is like the holopartation, which um, they were doing, I think, with an array of, of uh, Azure Connect cameras, you know, like the yeah. depth sensing, like a, a significant kind of a array that would capture you from all sides. But the idea is that you could do this with 
with a just one or even uh, mm -hmm. there was conversation about this happening with just a 2D camera with um with with software and AI down the road and and there's stuff like that on phones a, a little bit um mm -hmm. so I think what the but then of course you have to set up a camera to do that <laughs> so it's kind of like you can, it wouldn't be in your headset the, Microsoft it was showing that on stage uh, before and after in this crazy dance party thing but then also was, is one small note is that if you went to the Burning Man experience in Altspace VR mm -hmm. uh, last summer, it turns out they were like test driving this tech. Ah. Um, so, so they said like some of the stuff for Mesh was kind of being explored experimentally there, mm -hmm. especially uh, Diplo and, and Bariton, who was a um, like really active social presence uh, on Twitter. Um, he, um, they had this uh, holographic <laughs> presence. So mm -hmm. um, they, they were basically uh, doing the same thing, but like last summer. But I'm thinking about it because I'm going, were they using the same thing? I think yeah, so. Yeah, it, it yeah. It seems kind of similar. Okay, Is there anything sorry, else you want to... Sorry, guys. Yeah, go ahead. Before, before we do this, we're going to cut yeah. to a brief break. There is an audio delay. Um, okay. The video audio is not syncing on the YouTube side of things. So we're going to take a quick break we're to see if we can sort that out. Podcast. Okay. And refresh this broadcast. So live stream viewers stick with us. Audio people clearly won't hear this. Okay, we're back, and uh, hopefully our, our audio delay troubles have been solved. We're going to jump right back into our chat about Microsoft Mesh with Scott Stein from CNET. Scott, can you tell us more about like what this experience was like in your home? Uh, because I did a little bit of this, too. I got a HoloLens 2 to test out. Uh, I went into this meeting with other journalists, and uh, yeah, Microsoft's head of mixed reality. Um, it was really interesting, right? Because there was a virtual table in front of me. There were people all around me. I was just sitting right here at my desk as usual, but it felt like I was actually doing a briefing, like a group briefing like we used to in person with other people. Did you get any sense of that with your demo? Yeah, definitely. And mm -hmm. it, it got to the point where, and I've only experienced this one other time with like, again, like that spatial, spatial mm -hmm. was working on this thing with where the AR, they were going to have AR people moving around your home. <laughs> I found that... Um, and, and th that idea when you have AR stuff moving around a real space, not only was it pinned really well, so I felt like the table like stuck yep. and I was able to move around it really easily, but like my body language started to become more like, uh, like walk around conversational. So I found like I wasn't, I got beyond the staring at a screen part, which I yep. thought was really intriguing. Yep. And so that part, like the way it lingers in my memory, um, <laughs> became really cool you know mm -hmm. in a lot of ways like the, the some things on the hollands hold it back like the display on the hollands obviously like it will not a lot of people have seen it yeah but not just a limited field of view but it's a little bit um rainbowy hazy you know the way it does with waveguides it's 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 still finding its way i think in terms of versus the crystal clear mm -hmm. type of resolution on modern vr headsets um 
but so but I even so, that... like 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 I, I think what you were getting at here is that the way you thought of this, right? The way you experienced it was yes. different than maybe a meeting on your computer or in a VR headset. Like um, the philosophy nerd in me is thinking of like the qualia aspect of uh, what this means, right? The experience of seeing other people around you and also having an AR headset. So you're still seeing the real world, right? It is like those things are around you in a right? Yeah, that's the wild part too. And you mentioned mm -hmm. still seeing the real world around you is it, it, the, the comfort of not just being able to talk with people, but like you can pull out your phone, although your yeah, face ID yeah. may not work. And, you know, and then you, you can you just kind of check on things. Like, I think I was, I went and like close, like, I think I was, I went and like close the door and fix some stuff. But I realized he just saw me just, he read the yeah. motions, but and knew what I was doing. And um, that, that's like a really, it, it's about kind of a comfort level of behavior. It's like the weirdest mm -hmm. thing. It's not like there is some teleporting reality, but it's also like you think about like the zoom fatigue for me is like the rigidity yeah. um, mm -hmm. of like every, mm -hmm. everything is straight on. And here it's like, you can kind of chill out a little bit, you know, and <laughs> yeah. um, talk and just do the things you would normally be doing. And I think that's really fascinating. Plus the ability to mm -hmm. look at things. Uh, as you can start having virtual things to look gotcha. at. We looked at jellyfish, uh, you know, like yep. a lot of standard <laughs> immersive things, jellyfish, a giant whale. Yeah, um, well, there's like thing. a model of the moon, a model of the earth that we were like passing around to you. And even though the HoloLens display isn't perfect, it still looked like very high resolution. Like I could yes. peek in there and see like individual craters on the moon and everything. Um, let's like, I was going to bring this up towards the end, but I do think it's worth pointing out now, like Scott, there's a lot of talk about the Apple AR glasses and what, you know, having a nice pair of glasses that was digitally infused. Is this the sort of thing you'd like to see in a device like that? And do you think that would make those things more useful? You mean like the type of thing I'd like to see? Or like like yeah. a, like a improved like hardware the, type of? Improved hardware, but also like if you weren't just wearing a HoloLens uh, headset, but in your glasses, you could just see these like virtual beings and holograms and stuff too like i feel like that would be a game changer for a lot of people yeah it would and especially if it got to the point where the resolution and i know microsoft's continuing mm -hmm. to work on stuff undoubtedly um that just crossing over that gap a little bit you know some of the micro led tech which i haven't really seen in action but like you know i think that there is stuff to come display wise that's gonna um take it forward and work with our, our mm -hmm. regular glasses. Although I, I really love that the HoloLens 2 fits over my glasses. I feel like mm -hmm. that's yep. still something I appreciate that it's like, it's pretty accommodating. <laughs> um, but it's more like a, a work visor. You know, I felt like I was, I, I look pretty nerdy in a fun way. Um, <laughs> super nerdy, super nerdy. Yeah. Like so you spent a lot of time with uh, the Magic Leap uh, headset as well, RIP Magic yeah. Leap. I know you've done a lot of coverage around them. How is this, what the HoloLens 2 is doing versus what you were seeing from Magic Leap? Because I feel like that was the geek, uh, that was like the ideal. That was the dream of pure augmented reality stuff beamed right to your eyes, but unfortunately they couldn't keep it up. Yeah. Yeah, God, Magic Leap. You know, the hardest mm -hmm. part with Magic Leap is I just got to demo it so few times. It was so locked down that like, yeah. you know, the times I had it, the Magic Leap was cool in that it it was, um, you know, so it looked so much more compact in a sense. Mm -hmm. But you, I, I it wouldn't work with my glasses, so I had to get contacts every single time. Oh man, to use it. And, yeah, I I'd get my get my keep my disposable contacts at hand in case there was a demo. So that was annoying. Uh, uh, they did have prescriptions, but it didn't go to my prescription. So mm. uh, and then you have to get in inserts. I think with with also with Magic Leap they had the controller, yeah. But they didn't quite prove out the hand tracking, you know. And that's something that Microsoft went really bold with having no controller for the Hololens too. Everything is done with your hands, mm -hmm. and that's that's pretty hard because even with the Oculus Quest Two, which I feel like there's a lot in common between the Quest Two and Hololens Two in the in the ease of use, that is hand tracking, but it it doesn't feel as precise in the sense that I wouldn't feel comfortable using it all the time for everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's more and, like a nice added feature rather than the primary input. Right. Yeah. So I think that lends a really like that, that was the bet for Microsoft was to get a more real life tactile feel. And I, I love like, you know, tapping on my wrist, open the mm -hmm. menu and tapping the buttons in space, which do things. Sometimes that gets a little 
sometimes I want a shortcut. It's weird. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but I don't think anyone's come up with anything better. And I mm -hmm. think that it's, it's like definitely the model for where I think things need to start with and go. So um, that's the big difference for me is like comfort interaction um, is like nothing I saw in any of their AR headset. Gotcha. Let's move on to like what we saw at the Ignite keynote, which wasn't using HoloLens, at least for the viewers, right? That was Altspace VR on various VR headsets. And Altspace VR is this company Microsoft bought a couple of years ago. They were basically a struggling virtual reality collaboration company, similar to Spatial. Kind of, Microsoft kind of saved them. Uh, but they used that tech and then they gave us a new mesh powered version of Altspace VR um, that could see. Uh, basically, could you describe it, Scott? Like once you jumped into Altspace, what did you see for the keynote? Yeah, so uh, what I saw, it was hard to tell where the mesh played in at this point. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, in the sense, uh, Altspace already has these pretty elaborate virtual worlds. And Burning Man was a great example of that, how far it can go. But um, what you saw was this auditorium. And that was really cool is on stage, um, there was this whole, like, you know, uh, virtual presentation where Alex Kitman appears as a hologram of himself, you know, the actual him mm -hmm. wearing photorealistic like it looked very legit yeah yeah like wearing a hololens it's it, it, the sort of stuff you'd see in like an experimental sundance like <laughs> vr experience like that was like right. produced but not versus like being live mm -hmm. and uh and again like at burning man if you happen to see that diplo concert or a baritone thurston talking they had that same thing and i remember at the time being like what the heck is this? I was like, I've never seen this. <laughs> what, what, what magic? Tell me about this. So what sorcery is this? Yeah. Right. So then he presented this talk and then different things beamed in, um, you know, he had an aquarium around him. He brought in ocean X, uh, the nonprofit, who's one of the early partners. They started showing VR things around, mm -hmm. but then they also had some people again, appear as, as holograms with that holoportation. Holoportation as the Holoportation. <laughs> Holoportation. And James Cameron appeared um, uh -huh. talking about Avatar 2 a bit and um, wearing And it also, and he, he's tied to that show, right? Because I wrote this up a couple of weeks ago. So Ocean X is doing the show called Ocean Explorer. James yep. Cameron is the producer. And they basically create this high-tech boat that's going to go around the world and do a lot of cool stuff uh, for underwater research. But apparently they are building a what are, what are they calling it like a vr they're calling it like a holographic lab or yeah, something because like they're a lab or a hollow yeah, lab <laughs> they have a table there which again is like that that marble or as they as um i spoke with someone from motion x um about this and they're very inspired by the tree scene in avatar you know which is like they, mm -hmm. they think of that model but you know you've seen this before in the movies the big virtual map appears and you all gather around it death star plans or whatever else <laughs> and you you figure out what to do. And they, they're building that on the boat, but also what's really cool is that it's going to use some of the submersibles 3D data and show you like the map of the floor of the ocean in real time. Mm -hmm. And they want to beam in people around the table. So that plays out, that's pretty cool. And that's cool. And like researchers from practical. around the world can all work together and view this data that the ship is collecting. Like that is the ultimate and remote work collaboration that they're envisioning here. Yeah, yeah. So that was pretty mm -hmm. wild. And then they had the demo um, conversation. John Heckey from, from, from Niantic came in, talked about um, uh, Pokemon Go. Then they showed a, mm -hmm. a, like a concept video of, <laughs> first it was, it was cartoon Alex Kitman, which again mm -hmm. was like what, what I saw in the HoloLens too. Um, then they show him moving around in the idea of like, you know, could you play Pokemon Go in the real world with glasses sure. on, with your magic mm -hmm. gaming glasses? I, I got to talk with um, with John over um, over another Teams meeting or uh, Zoom. I forget which platform it was. And then we talked about where they're going with this, and they're using the Hololens too to model what future glasses gaming is going to be. Like. Uh huh. Uh huh. And because again, I don't think there's a better example of AR glasses at the moment than Hololens too for modeling these interactions. <laughs> And can we describe what what you saw? Yeah. What we saw in the video was he walks through this park. He sees Pokemon just kind of wandering around, like the, the stuff I imagined as a kid. He sees a Pikachu jump in front of him. He opens his hand, pulls up a menu, which is how all the Hololens menu works, and uh, he feeds the Pikachu, and Pikachu is very happy. 
I can imagine this being like a thing we move towards after, you know, Pokemon Go on phones. Yes. We're looking at and this then, right now, by the way, for the yeah. audio listeners. And I, I'm just like, the first thing I, I expected when we saw these Pokemon gathered at this person's feet was I wanted him to throw a Pokeball at them. But it still looks <laughs> kind of janky. I think this is what Scott was talking about when you mentioned, like, you want some shortcuts. Like, the yes. menu still takes several steps. It's still like yeah. you drag and drop the ball towards the ground instead of mm-hmm. holding it in your hand and tossing it. Like, we're still a little bit far. Yeah. I'm sure we'll get there. More intuitive. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. This video is just CG. This video is nothing of like the tech. Not actual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) One one thing that VR has in its corner is that most VR controllers have gamepad like buttons, and they're Mm -hmm. really helpful because you can like do quick reaction stuff. And then in in AR, it's like I have to reach out and grab things. (laughs) But the other interesting thing here is like not just the Pokemon, but what they're what they're really trying to explore is what happens when you invite a friend to like holoport in next to you yeah. and and as they were saying in the phone in the phone call or the, the chat there's no real clear understanding for the metaphysics of that like it, uh-huh. it's very weird like i think about it when alex kitman was in my office he couldn't see my office <laughs> mm-hmm. and i couldn't see his office but we had some things we agreed on so if you're beaming in to play pokemon go am i only seeing like your pokemon in san francisco right. or are you seeing mine in New York or are Mm. we like, what the heck is going on? So I think that they're, it's like, you have to agree on space. Um, And, and there's like three worlds. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. So in a sense, I think it's a laboratory experiment that they're trying to work out with an acknowledgement that there will be other players in the landscape. Most definitely. It's, it's funny because they announced earlier a couple of months ago that they're killing Minecraft earth. uh, I think in June or later this year. And that seems like Microsoft's big, push to doing a Pokemon Go like v- AR, VR world type thing. I can imagine that being amazing. That's in a device that's powered by mesh, you know, and actually letting you step into Minecraft. Uh, did you have much experience with that? Like, do you think that's something they could eventually bring back and revive and apply through mesh and AR? Yeah, it's surprising that that's happening with, my, with yeah. Minecraft because I feel like it's, it is very ahead of its time. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that that's exactly the model. Like Minecraft is like they, they have a killer app right in their pocket. Um, and it is already being used in so many different ways, including AR and VR. So yeah, I think it's a great place to start, especially since it's so versatile. You know, I, th- I think like block universe and collaborative and education, <laughs> like it, I think that's, that's the way to go. But Microsoft, mm-hmm. like that's what surprises me is there's a lot of starts and stops in the landscape. You know, Microsoft will start one thing and then not do something else or, I'm still surprised there isn't more movement in the VR headsets or why aren't there consumer glasses and Google moving away from AR and VR recently. Um, It's very weird. Xbox VR, where is it? You know, like Sony says new PSVR is coming, but we still, Microsoft is not doing much for consumers aside from mixed reality headsets. Yeah. It's baffling to just Mm -hmm. because I feel that it it obviously works on PlayStation VR. I mean, whether or not you want to use it, um, (laughs) And, you know, but it's, it's, it's cool. And Microsoft mm-hmm. has all those tools. So like, it seems like, you know, it's just their decision at this point to figure out what they want to do with it. But the other players are like, are moving and evolving. It's at this, I feel like it's this big AR VR poker game. It's great. It's great. Competition yeah. is great, right? Everyone is kind of pushing forward. Let's just wrap up the, the uh, keynote talk because something cool did happen, right? Like Alex Kipman, I, I think at first, as we were watching that uh, initial hollow portation version of Alex Kipman, it almost seemed like 2D to me, right? Because the audience was all on one side of the screen. You could not go around him. Towards the end of the keynote, we get transported to this, uh, the Burning Man like world that you were talking about where you can freely explore the environment. And then there's um, Kipman and then there's other people dancing in a circle and you can kind of wander around them and see them in full 360 degrees. And then it was like, oh yeah, they are rendering everything here, right? That was really cool. Mm-hmm. And um <laughs> and like absurd and interesting. <laughs> like I, I was self-conscious and also let myself go in it. But I, I, I didn't expect that everything would enter this interactive phase where you're kind of browsing around. And there was there were a ring of like, there was like a recorded video around of people dancing mm-hmm. that were more 2D. And then there were cartoon avatars that were us in 3D. And then in the middle was this bonfire with um, Alex Kitman, Guy La Liberté, who's the... Uh, founder of Cirque du Soleil who's working mm-hmm. on this weird mixed reality immersive <laughs> theater concept called 
an eye world. And that it was like, and, and several other people were with them who I didn't know. And then they were all like holoporting and I got really close. Like you walk past and kind of feel like they should see you and that yeah, like yeah. they were going to say hi. So it felt very successful in that regard, but everyone was casting beams into a fire and it was like a ritual. There was a dome of stars, like, and then all of a sudden the keynote was over and then we were like, Oh, I guess we're going to back go into now. the real world where it's yeah, a lot right. less interesting right now. <laughs> <laughs> like a keynote where you suddenly end up in a mystical fire ritual. <laughs> hey, I mean, that's that's what I imagine always happening when I used to go to keynotes uh, in California. Sherlyn, do you have any questions? Like, what's up? Uh, like, I'm sure you've seen so, all this. Yeah. So, so, so many things to ask and say. So one, when you were talking about the um, glasses and having that meeting in your shared space, mm -hmm. I'm surprised nobody made a Kingsman reference. I know the Marvel reference was made, but this is... I mean... Not the Literally first thing yes. Not that Kingsman. comes to Come mind. On. Come on. Kingsman. A lot of movies, they've done this where you put on- Maybe Jarvis. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's very very light and looking glasses. And mm -hmm. you're having an, a meeting with people around you around a table, Knights of the Round Table kind of. Um, and that seems to be where we're headed, hopefully, um, even if it's still far away in the future. We had a question from um, our video uh, director, Julio wants to know, I guess he's all about making the big bucks here. <laughs> Is there advertising potential in hollow, hollow oh God. graphics and VR? Don't yet? ruin, don't ruin our beautiful holographic <laughs> world before right. it's even begun. You're going to have to select. All the pop-up sure. ads before you can see this. Exactly. Face, you have to pay 50 <laughs> cents or something. There have been there have been concept art videos about that, you know, like that. That's that's the uh, dystopian mm -hmm. nightmare of being surrounded by all these things, um, very Blade Runnery. Uh, sure, <laughs> I think that's the battle, right? The battle over our eyes and our senses is like yes. afoot, and I think mm -hmm. that's the even the whole discussion about Facebook and about like what they're going to do with all of the, the the data, the questions about privacy, and you know wh wh where do these controls begin and end? Yeah, every. There's gonna be a lot of questions about that because then you start letting that stuff in, and sure, you got floating hamburgers, and I don't know what else. <laughs> I mean, sure. I mean, so yeah. sorry. There's there's definitely a way to monetize this. I mean, Julio added mm -hmm. on and said that all he wants to do is buy IRL skins. I think it, like for your avatar, if you can buy some fresh fits. If you spend extra money, it's very Black Mirror like. I think. Mm -hmm. um, but Dev, you were saying. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, that is completely true. Um, I forget what I even was going to say, but so please go on. Many more questions for Lynn. Well, oh, yes. Think, Sorry, yeah. go ahead, mm -hmm. Scott. Oh, no, I was going to say, going into the skins, that's a really good point. I think yeah. maybe the analogy for ads may be right in front of us with video games. You know, it may, makes, makes mm -hmm. me think about, it. you know, look at Fortnite, look at, you mm -hmm. know, for example, I, I think maybe that's like the ad model, you know, where you have like branded things that come in and you get cool yes. gear and stuff that yes. you know, there's like a trade off with it versus just being bombarded like if you bombard with advertisements nobody's going to go there anymore so like you lose I, I even have like this awful scenario in my head where like god there's going to be real drops of like sneakers for the sneaker oh, man. in the real world and in the fake world where you want to buy a, a pair of shoes for your avatar <laughs> and you got to line up in the virtual store or a ps5 drop in the in the virtual world so mm -hmm. like That'll be that'll be awful. Dev, did you remember um, what you're gonna say? Uh, no, no. Let's 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 move on. I, um, yeah, NFT go holographic yeah. items. Never, exactly. We're getting yeah. there. Exactly. Well, yeah, yeah. we didn't talk about this on the Tribeca uh, Tribeca Sundance mm -hmm. episode of the podcast, uh, but I I wanted to initially talk about this. Scott, me, you, and Davindra were actually in this shared space in VR for Tri uh, Tribeca Sundance and. Mm -hmm. You and I shared a virtual hug. I don't know if you yes. remember this. It was great. It, <laughs> it was, was great. great. <laughs> but I was here's like, the thing. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. I was going to say that like the experience, though, leaves me feeling like there's still a lot to iron out here, right? Like th there were issues with the sun dancing. And granted, they're not Microsoft. But <laughs> there were issues there with like multiple avatars bearing your name popping up because what the server had an issue. You had to re-log in and your dead avatar is just standing in a corner <laughs> staring at a wall, whereas your actual live avatar is running around. Meanwhile, also kind of strange is the like idea that next to your avatar is your name as your or on top of your head is your name. So like when I was looking for Scott, I wasn't so much looking for your face on your stick figure avatar. I was looking for your name. And 
it, it's yeah. not that's not how the real world works i don't think right we don't run around mm-hmm. with name tags above our heads we have i mean i wish head. we did because then i'd remember people's names so it'd be a lot <laughs> <That's> easier <laughs> <laughs> would would help a bit yeah it mm-hmm. was it was super wonderful and awkward like um <laughs> and i think that's the whole sundance thing too I, when i came out of that and and like i got mixed reactions when i said this but i felt like the super structure of the experience the semi-broken nature of it mm-hmm. was like the more interesting most interesting piece of art like yeah and yeah. i don't yes. mean that to offend any of the artists doing like i think the art experiences were great but yeah. like it was so weird to try to do this at home and load the builds of things and things would break <laughs> and you're troubleshooting over zoom. And, and like, you know, I think that's like, it really felt experimental. So that's mm-hmm. what you're saying. It's like, this is, this is an off-road type of a thing, even if you have experience in VR stuff. And, um, and so I think that's like a real challenge. If you're going to get to this future, you yeah. need to have the stuff work without, even with the Microsoft stuff, there's a lot yep. of, hands-on guidance that mm. takes like still takes like an hour to get through yeah and so like we're obviously not there and we need to cross that yeah um, yeah sometime it's easy it's it reminds me of like the beginning of the internet too when like yeah getting an isp setting everything up it was so hard and difficult and then all of a sudden we had broadband and we had like a lot of things that made internet access easier for everybody. So we're kind of getting there. But I do think if you're, if you're somebody who listens to the Engadget podcast, if you're a kind of techie, I feel like this is the most interesting time, right? Cause you get to see everything right. built. You get to see the nuts and bolts and you get to see like how this new medium starts to reshape itself and mm-hmm. how it like incorporates new rules and whatnot. So yeah, it's very exciting. Even though we talk about so many things being broken, uh, Sherlyn, Scott, anything yeah. else you want to add about Microsoft Mesh or where all of this is going, you think? Well, I think it's super interesting to think about, like we spent a whole year indoors, like mm-hmm. yeah. away from people. And I think we talk about like what we did to get by with work. And, you know, I, I've explored VR and AR, but a lot of my work tools, like they've all had to be not VR and AR because mm-hmm. no one else is there. <laughs> but I think companies are, are trying to solve not just VR and AR, but like how you evolve these pretty limited tools that we've had. And so there's a, there's a big push and it's coming from all different directions, gaming and, mm-hmm. and otherwise. So I think foreign. that's so interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, True, truly yeah. foreign, truly, truly. Right. Yeah. So like all this stuff, this is the point at which virtual starts for a lot of people. And mm-hmm. I think that's, what's really intriguing is like, you can go back to the whole history of VR and AR, but it's kind of being rebooted now. And I think I'm really excited in seeing that, how it reverberates off the companies and what people mm-hmm. figure out, resetting my own baked in expectations too. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the Engadget podcast, Scott. Where can people find you on the internet for more of your coverage? Oh, sure. Well, at CNET, um, I, I'm always writing and doing stuff there. Twitter at Jet Scott, where I... I put weird thoughts all the time and um (laughs) and those are good those are the two best places really excellent thank you so much yeah thank you thanks scott okay great we're gonna pause we got some q and a's yeah we're gonna do a quick q and a and you can keep recording and once we're done with the q and a then you can log off uh save that recording and shoot it to us over uh was it we transfer yeah. So I was going to say Mark Dell uh, mentions this and I actually wanted to bring it up, but I didn't uh-huh. get to it. Um, Mark Dell wants to know about Unreal and we can share your desktop screen in mesh. So Unreal, have you, oh, yeah. you, you, have you seen Unreal, uh, Jet? Yes. Uh, Scott? Yes. Jet? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I have seen Unreal and I was trying to get some sort of review in it for a while, but mm-hmm. like they kind of delayed their launch a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So I can tell you about Unreal. Unreal has really a really cool pair of glasses. They're kind of like a precursor to what Qualcomm's working on now with some of this next wave glasses mm. stuff. Um, the first version did not do real six degree of freedom. Like it didn't really track your room and the, and your mm. surroundings like um, like like a Magic Leap or, or Hololens did. But apparently, Unreal's working on a new version. Like these new Qualcomm glasses will much like Oculus Quest 2 have two cameras that can track your your world smoothly. Mm-hmm. So they could be like a super portable HoloLens. Um, that's what they're aiming for. 
but they're also going to be like a number of, other, of those other types of glasses. Right now, they're overseas. I know they, uh, yeah. in, um, yeah, Hong I think it's, they're in South Korea. I think like, um, you know, there, there's a lot of like international kind of launch rollout for them. Yeah, and Rio looks like one of the big reasons and Rio was very interesting uh, was because of the size and weight uh, of it and what it was about, able to achieve. It was even, I think, smaller and lighter than uh, Magic Leap. Maybe Definitely. totally different. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. Um, and reels were just little fold-up glasses with kind of a, a, yeah. a still slightly chunky, like half lens thing. But um, those are also a wave of like a lot of those devices, like Qualcomm's calling smart viewers. Mm -hmm. um, but they're really more a little more powerful than that. They're going to plug right into your phone and, and use the processor off that, kind of like Magic Leap with its puck. But the, but the hardware is going to be a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ben, uh, I know you've been looking at the questions. Did you have any? Yeah, so I got a bunch of stuff. It seems like Kay Asante in the chat was maybe a, a present for one of these oh, uh, cool. things. You know, maybe not the. I mean, all um, you needed was a VR headset to see the Alt Space VR thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. Of so it. so yeah, not the press briefing that was really only for press, but yeah, the Alt Space VR stuff. So. Cool. Uh, I mean, the general sense that they got was just that it. Uh, the best analogy that they heard is that it's Microsoft. Microsoft Mesh is Xbox Live for VR, which could yep. be pretty cool. Uh, Mark uh, said something else that was just silly. Think about all the virtual dogs you could surround yourself with. Sure, <laughs> but. <laughs> On the other hand, um, you know, that gets into the like Pokemon issue where it seems like it's pretty janky. And so they they don't want to over promise. You can't interact with the Pokemon in space. It's not like you can pet the Pokemon and have them react. And you certainly not can't. Not yet, but yeah. that could be the goal. And, yeah. and you certainly can't feel it yourself. That would require a lot more um, hardware for your hands. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But yes, you could surround yourself with the concept of AR dogs. And then there was another VR, comment. Oh, yes, VR or AR dogs. Or AR cats, uh, which are better. <laughs> uh, and then there was a, another comment by a Joan Riso uh, that said uh, voice, uh, voice command might be the most efficient way to control AR glasses. Um, just because then it, depends. Yeah. It, it frees up your arms and maybe the, the thing that I got the feeling about is like you want to minimize the strange movements that you're making that maybe don't make sense mm -hmm. to people who the voice commands them. are pretty strange too as like a ux thing um because hololens yeah. supports that right scott but it's not it like does. it's not always the ideal way to do it yeah but if you there think are... about like mm -hmm. how we've moved through this on a societal level yeah. you know like as of 2007 or 2008 we were already getting used to the idea of people with bluetooth headsets <laughs> just like standing on the street and talking and no they aren't having any kind of mental health crisis they are actually just talking on the phone and you can't see the little piece in their ear so as a as a society, I think we are a little bit more accepting of voice commands just because we've yeah. done that already. Even, but like think think about in the before times, right? When you were on the subway, how many people were going, "Hey Siri," you know, or "Hey Google," yeah, pretty, like, pretty out pretty in much public, no one. pretty much nobody. No one. Because the yeah. I think there is a social, uh, it it's kind of like a home. social disruptor. Yeah, it has to be at home. At home, if you're just sticking around here, then yeah, whatever. Call all your, the uh, yeah, assistants. Mm -hmm. There is a cool thing. It's interesting bringing up the voice because that is a good point. Like one thing, for instance, like Oculus Quest 2, I keep forgetting to bring up voice commands. And sometimes yep. it can be really helpful in cutting mm -hmm. through a lot of stuff. On the HoloLens, there's an interesting thing you can do, which is um, you can look at something and then say, like, close that window or yep. whatever. And so there's a combination of, because as eye tracking, of where you look plus voice command, which that, that does get really interesting. Like, it, you're right. Like, there are some ways... I think mm -hmm. because a lot of voice, you're just kind of floating in a void, trying to explain what specifically you're referring to. But if you're already looking at that thing and then you speak, it's like a combination of like intent and the thing. Yeah. But I, I, I also want to get like micro gestures. I want to get to the point where like I can look at something and then just do that and close it. Or maybe yeah. that opens it. Or maybe it's like, so you get to the point where it's not like this or this, mm -hmm. all these things that you're doing. <laughs> But you just get to the point like multi-touch where it's like quick little 
But then you have to have like a thing on your hand. Yeah, like something. Or something. Yeah. Patent diagrams that were flying around recently about like. <laughs> well, um, one of one of the types. other con bits of tape like uh, on people's hands or something. I mm -hmm. I saw it as I was scrolling through some kind of feed, so I only like partially. Understood. Have you ever used that? Mudra Band? So, like, you know, this uh -huh. is the weird part. Uh, Mudra this Band, is, yes. This is like, um, this is neural input tech weirdness. So, like, you and companies are working on this too. Like, you could get to the point mm -hmm. where you're wearing something on your hand mm -hmm. that could sort of sense how you're moving your fingers or how much you're pushing. Yeah, exactly. And if that if that really evolves, then you're at the point where you could do that stuff. Um, that's what I was. That's what I was trying to bring up, which is these mm -hmm. like. Uh, upload style gloves that you put on that can tell how you're yeah right ne neural sensing and they can tell how you're moving your fingers and they can give you back haptic feedback so you can feel like you're actually touching things in the real world too but obviously that's like way in the future and very far ahead but scott have you tried mudra band because i didn't get I to have. touch it <laughs> nice i have i got to use nice. it last ces and i never like it was like one of these things that like I think the pandemic happened. Like we shot a video after a CES. So they actually came to the office and it was, it was like the greatest thing I didn't get to write in more depth about. Mm. So a lot, like, like a lot of this stuff, it, it feels a little bit janky and yet mm. a little magical. So mm -hmm. uh, I never use control labs tech, which you know, Facebook uh, acquired, but this mm. is like, you know, you're it, what it could do is it could sense, not just sense the pressure of your fingers, but the mm -hmm. really trippy part of the demo was they showed how it could sense your finger movement without moving your hand. Oh, that's so, nice. Mm -hmm. wow. So like the idea is that if you were, uh, you know, if you didn't have a hand, if you, mm -hmm. if you, right. oh, okay. tech, you couldn't move your hand, that this could be used. A lot of this oh, neural awesome. input stuff is meant to be focused on assistive tech. Same thing yes. with, um, I got to use the um, Nextmind headband, which looks at your visual cortex and like you Ooh. can stare at these flashing things which then focuses like clicks so the <laughs> idea is they want to explore that but a lot of this is like very still very imprecise and they all mm -hmm. admit that it's like going yeah. to take years facebook yeah has no has like a five-year timeline at least <laughs> like I, I asked the bosworth about that about like neural input tech it's like, I, oh, yeah. He was like, <laughs> and I was like, this year? And he's like, no, 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 not this, <laughs> not this year. He's like, the, uh, like, you know, I think they're looking at everything is like in a five year time frame. Sure, sure. So, I can imagine like the headband eventually being a thing that accepts some neural like input of some kind. Yeah. Yes, so we do have yes. one mm -hmm. question from Nathania that just asks about ps5 on vr and ar <laughs> and i think that may be actually a little bit early to say anything about because i mean we just got the announcement about ps5 vr sure. like what was it last week two weeks ago but it's a good topic to talk about yeah. um mm. i you know the, they so they, they were very coy about details they mentioned one cable connection higher resolution mm -hmm. i did get to speak like Back in 2019, I got to speak with Dominic Mallinson, who's the PlayStation R&D head. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about all the things they were thinking about in the future PSVR, like including eye tracking, which I don't yeah, think will yeah. ever play out. A lot of it is cost versus um, practicality. But I think, but when you mentioned AR, one thing that came to mind for me is I was thinking not just the simple all-contained VR that is now becoming more, like the Oculus Quest is kind of resetting that expectation. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these are doing pass-through experiments in AR. Mm -hmm. And that's like the next wave where these are going to start doing more of that and allowing you to see the real world through the headset, put in VR overlays and make it look like AR. Mm -hmm. And with Sony's history in blending AR, like they've had AR games going way back. I feel like that could be the killer, fun, magical thing that they do. Like I wonder if they're going to put AR in in the VR headset, and you can do I, Astro's. I program. really, I really wonder. I feel like that's something. If if Nintendo had more of this tech and had like the technical, you need Nintendo's ingenuity and you need Sony's technology to really yes. make this stuff kind of work. And I think AR Sony lacks the ingenuity. Sometimes would be very. They popular. sometimes have it. Yeah, yes. sometimes. I mean the the Mario Kart, uh, the actual realistic carts that you can play with your Switch. That's pretty cool. That's almost AR like. Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 they keep advancing in there, and then like Nintendo mm -hmm. has had stuff for like the three D 
the three DS and the and the AR on the first three DS and um, Virtual <laughs> Boy. And, yeah, they keep like dabbling in it and then drifting out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. Any more questions? I want to be conscious of your time, Scott. Yeah, yeah. Jet, we're we're running a little over the time. I promised yeah. we would end. Um, I will say thanks I'm for being on here. Time. Mark Dell, one of our regulars, is excited to see you here. They've, you know, he's seen your videos Yay. from SpeedNet a lot. Hey, it's really great <laughs> to be on here. I, 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 you guys are great. And um, Thank I, you. I hadn't, I, this is my first time actually talking about the demos. So it's like uh, really fun yay. to get to do that. We got the I exclusive. Have all this, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We want to spill. We just want to, I got to talk to somebody about this crazy stuff I saw. Yeah. And it was I was really like having a nervous that. breakdown Monday <laughs> trying to write the story because yeah. I really oh. felt the, oh, the God, hardest yeah. part. Every time I tried to write a headline for this, it sounded like I was muddled in, in jargon. I was yeah. until 3 a.m. writing that story because I like, how do I translate this into human speak? Yeah. It was awful. <laughs> like, because a lot of the stuff is like, you know, ways to connect the infrastructure. Of, like, I was like, oh, God, just back uh, away. I, Never yes. use platform and, in the headline. Platform, bad, death, yeah. <laughs> yes. And then the, everything comes back to like, I feel like I'm telling the <laughs> Star Wars holograms around your table <laughs> thing. It's like one ring yeah. can rule them all for headlines. Like, exactly. I feel like that just keeps happening over and over again in stories. And I'm like, I can't make it about Star Wars holograms <laughs> around a table. No more. Oh. Um, no more. So it, was it's, really it is hard. It's important to have someone else who could talk about VR also, because yeah. if you're just talking to one person who did some kind of VR... You um, sound like a crazy person. Yeah, yeah. you sound like a cra yes. crazy person, yeah. or it sounds like you're trying to do like dream interpretation or something mm -hmm. like that. That's a good point. This is a good sanity exactly. check. Like, exactly. We're, mm -hmm. we're corroborating. We're it's like, yeah, it's like you had a weird David Lynch experience. Yeah, yeah. And you're saying, so two people we had who went to the VR um, press event means that you weren't, it wasn't just one person in a fugue state or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> We we have uh, by the way a picture of uh, a picture for our viewers um, of, uh, of a little of a little thing huh. dogs in VR. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. So uh, Scott, we, that we, dog we try to have fun with the dogs. Scott. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's that's like it's nice to do. It's nice to do those things. There's some comfort <laughs> in VR. Sometimes. One day you can strap on a VR headset to your favorite canine friend or or feline oh, yeah nintendo dogs vr <gasps> nintendo you've just there you go. you've just announced nintendo dogs vr launch nintendo title. Dogs. Nintendo you heard dogs it here cats. first you heard it here first that's that's how they'll sell all of them and then they'll For chase sure. virtual pikachus they'll go crazy chasing these virtual oh my Pikachus. god yeah, seriously. seriously nintendo dogs and cats for the for whatever thing they're doing just do that nope. The oh. latest Mario Switch game is basically just all cats. It's Mario in a cat suit, right? So yeah, uh, they, can, <laughs> they can do a lot of this. Uh, We're trademark okay. it right here. I don't ask all for right. much anymore. I just want to feel happy. <laughs> Do we have any other questions we want to jump to, or shall no, we move on? Yeah, I think we're figured out. So, Scott, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you so we'll much. Know, this uh, is great. Get to, Scott, we'll keep chatting. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And please and send along your audio uh, to that email chain. Yeah, I will. Let me save it as a wave. And yes. um, send it to your email. Okay. Hopefully great. that works. All right. So we're going to be talking about Google in just a second. All right. Thank you, Scott. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks, Scott. See you. Well, hopefully, see you soon. Yeah. See you soon. <laughs> All right. Let's take a second here. We are moving on mm -hmm. to something I think it, it is just as important. To be honest, like this from is something like, very visual to something not visual at all, though. Yeah. But industry shaking. Whenever you're ready. Oh yeah, I'm ready. I am too. All right. Do you want me to kick it to you, Sherlyn? Yes. Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's move out of the world of VR and AR. And actually, we were just talking about a bit about ads and what that could look like in the future. Yep. It turns out the ad world is kind of shifting beneath our feet right now because Google just announced some pretty interesting news about mm -hmm. its ad business. Sherlyn, can you give us like the explanation here? What's up? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I saw that you you covered the news for Engadget. Um, Basically, a lot of the browsers in the business, including Apple, Safari, Mozilla's Firefox, have committed to not supporting third-party cookies moving forward. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, third-party cookies are what track your some of your you know preferences and your 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 uh, browsing behavior over the internet, so that 
other sites can use them to tailor ads to you. And so with Safari and Mozilla saying they, or Apple and Mozilla saying uh, at least like last year that they will no longer support their party cookies and Google saying that in January last year too, um, this has sort of been in the works. But this week, Mm -hmm. Google announced that it plans to uh, adopt, like it kind of uh, told the world what Mm -hmm. it sees as the future of you, like using creating targeted ads for you without their yeah. party cookies basically so basically like the core of google's business right the stuff that actually helped their search engine business was not the thing that propelled the company it was ads Is it was ads. being able to like yeah create personalized ads that track you around the internet that is changing and how mm-hmm. is that changing yeah so so basically uh there are like with third party cookies sort of being phased out and the support of it being phased out across different browsers um all these advertisers and and businesses that support these targeted ads have had to figure out what are we going to do right Mm -hmm. and so there are some proposals around the internet about like using things like hashed emails and like if you agree to give your email address to like one website and another and another they (laughs) can use it to build a profile you yeah right and like when i was listening or like when i was hearing about that i was just like oh that does not sound great either (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Let let me just say this news has led to some really interesting quotes from Google. And I just want to shout this out here. Like, can you imagine these words coming from Google like last year? Right. People quote, people shouldn't have to accept being tracked across the web in order to get the benefits of relevant advertising. And that's David Kempkin, director of product management for Google's ads privacy. He says, and advertisers don't need to track individual consumers across the web to get the performance benefits of digital advertising. This is bonkers i would never yeah. expect google to say this it's yeah. it's it is google taking clear stance so basically anyway um when when i said using hash emails that's one of the proposals that came out of the internet that's not what google is saying is using in yeah. fact google is saying that it does not want to do that instead uh when it announced that it would be uh no longer supporting third-party cookies it said that it would be focusing instead on this thing called privacy sandbox which is mm-hmm. its own set of tools that it's kind of accepting proposals for and and researching to see what would be the best way to help advertisers still target you without you giving up your personalized tracking or in data and that sort of stuff. So um, one thing that Google said this week it would be focusing on is this thing called Flock. And uh, Flock, I'm trying to get the exact word. Federated in Learning of Cohorts API. Yeah. So it's all about so federated. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So federated is a word that like Google has used in a lot of different like ML stuff across the like across its mm-hmm. product po- portfolio. But here, yes, FLOC Flock is federated learning of cohorts. The keyword there is cohorts, right? Basically, mm-hmm. it's groups of 1,000 people and up that share similar interests. And so for them, it's like, let's say you like nike shoes then you're in the flock of nike shoe lovers and advertisers can choose to target flocks based on stuff like that so Uh i want to i i make shoes maybe i'm a competitor to nike let's say i'm adidas i guess uh i'm gonna target the the nike shoe flock or if I make mm-hmm. cupcakes, I'm going to t- target the muffin shoe, f- muffin shoe, muffin flop. Muffin shoes. Yeah. <laughs> muffin <laughs> shoes. Business idea. You heard it here first. Um, so that's kind of going to be the way Google mm-hmm. is uh, tr- going to try to serve you right. ads in the future. You And by, and, and by and, targeting groups, they can never see you individually. Right. Like your right. individual data is not going to be visible, which is that. Okay. I'm down with that. That seems good. I agree. And and one thing that has been made somewhat clear to me is that they won't go, so far the goal is to not go smaller than 1000. So these right. cohorts are going to be at least 1000 people and up so that you're not so ad- identifiable. Um there's still a lot they're figuring out. It doesn't sound like they have intersectionality con- like considered yet. Like they don't know if it's mm-hmm. going to be like oh, Nike shoe lovers who live in this specific neighborhood um, even if that's like above a thousand still, they're still figuring it out. But right, the right, support right. for third party cookies in Chrome is phasing out over two years. So it'll happen fully in 2022. But Safari and Mozilla have already stopped. Like by default, Safari no longer supports third party cookies. So mm-hmm. if you already hate relevant, so called relevant ads being served to you, you can already kind of mm-hmm. use Safari, I guess, to avoid that happening. Mm-hmm. But there's other questions like for me the bigger question here is like okay so app, apple mozilla and google are doing this right but app, google's not the only one serving tracking cookies facebook has 
it's tracking cookie across all of its different ones. That's why like Instagram is so scary. I mean, of yeah. course, part of it mines some information from what already exists out there in other third-party cookies, but like there's Facebook and then there's Microsoft also makes browsers. Does Edge still support third-party cookies? I actually mm-hmm. am not fully up to Edge, speed well, on Edge whether it's based Edge. on Chromium now. So I do feel like they're going to follow whatever. Chromium they're going to follow and yeah, forward. follow yeah. phasing it out. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's no real other like huge browser in the space. I don't mm-hmm. believe so. This is mm-hmm. this is a shift in the way the it's internet a, works. I would call it a disturbance in the force, right? It is the <laughs> most powerful ad company in the world saying like, maybe the way we've been doing this for so long uh, isn't correct. But <laughs> my question for you, Sherlyn, is this genuine? Is Google doing this out of the kindness and goodness of their hearts? Or is there like an ulterior motive here? Because we've they've definitely been hit by governments and others uh, when it comes to privacy too. Yeah, you know, I, as a... I want to believe that people are good and I want to believe that, you know, people are just doing their best. And with Google, you know, I, I, the vibe that I get and going on vibes now, the vibe that I get from like someone like Sundar Pichai is that like, Mm -hmm. yeah, they're actually trying to do their best, but you're right. Like without being called out by so many different governments or, or different regulatory bodies, would they have decided to do this? And if had, Apple and uh, Mozilla not started saying they would stop supporting third-party cookies, would Google have done it first? I highly doubt it. Like, yeah. I feel like they had to see someone else do it first to be like, oh, yeah, we should be doing that. <laughs> um, the truly right. bold move isn't being taken by Google, but they do recognize, I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, there's something that needs to be done. And there's like, this kind of follows everything too. Like uh, the European Union's like push for greater privacy across the web, GDPR and everything kind of a flawed execution. A lot of people are complaining about Mm -hmm. that, but I do think it kind of got the conversation going about what are, what kind of world are we building here where, you know, these ads are so granularly targeted and tracking Mm -hmm. people. And as these things become more ingrained in our lives, we were just talking about VR ads and AR ads, right? I don't want a Mm -hmm. highly specific personalized AR ad floating around my house, you know, (laughs) like that is some black mirror stuff for sure. It's the thing where like the second you talk about something, like I remember (laughs) one time I was talking to my friend about rumble, boxing for like a workout class and the next thing yeah. i know instagram was serving me ads and i was like i didn't even type this mm. anywhere did they how? listen to me how, how did exactly. it happen i That's can imagine like having of... having a fight with your partner right and uh <laughs> an ad just popped up couples therapy <laughs> Right. That, that's what it? feels right. That's Ugh. what feels so invasive and intrusive. And that's what they're trying to avoid here. Now, I want to clarify that when you brought up GDPR, um, as a person whose understanding of the internet, it's a little bit, I think, different than most. I think I mm-hmm. freaked out a little bit when they said, like, oh, no longer supporting cookies. Because I was like, cookies like they're delicious. are used on a lot of <laughs> well, yes. But they're yeah. also used in a lot of different like things. Like they store information for your logins to maintain a session that's authenticated mm-hmm. and like your shopping carts. So I was like, wait, no longer supporting cookies. There are better if ways, were, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, if you were one of those people that thought so, no, they're just not supporting third party cookies. So like if mm-hmm. a website has its own cookie to authenticate a session and to keep that session authenticated, it will still be supported. It's just the cookies that are used from other sources like Google that mm-hmm. will no longer be supported on uh, on these browsers. So you can still have like some of those experiences. You don't need to think about, wow, the internet's really this like changing um, in, in, in the way we know it. And then the GDPR part of it, like I had questions too, right? Like mm-hmm. GDPR is also based on cookies, right? It's like, it's, it's saying that if you go to a website and then you are going to be tracking information and storing that on a cookie, you have to let the visitor agree or choose what cookies they're going to accept. And I was like, how does this work now? Do sites have to re-enroll? Do, you know, and my understanding is that Google is going to work on making sure it's compliant, the GDPR still. So what I envision happening is that when this flock based method does start rolling out, you might see like a resurgence of these agreements you have to agree to all over again. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, well... Seems like things are changing. We're going to be keeping an eye on this too, like just to make sure Google is actually doing what they say. But I think this is a major win for consumers. It's going to make Mm. life harder for online advertisers, for, you know, the online ad business. But they have been, let me just say, I have very little sympathy for them because they have been basically feeding off of our data for so long. It's a huge, huge industry. Things are going to be tough as we transition to more privacy, but I think it's going to be for the better, right? Oh, for sure. I I mean... Mm -hmm. It would just be less scary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can, 
I I've never been too too super concerned, I guess, about like my tracking habit. I, I'm not. I don't know what y'all are looking at on the internet, but I'm not really <laughs> looking at bad stuff. <laughs> um, so I've not uh, been that know. concerned. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But but it is a win for privacy and 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 like our own personal data being used to sell ads. And I think that that's where it feels like morally a little incongruous. So yeah, this is a good what else. Move. What else is going on from Google? Because I feel like I was hearing something yeah. about phone updates too, right? Yeah. So on the product, on the hardware slash software product side, uh, Google has been announcing a bunch of news. Last week, we heard about Android updates. This week, we got Pixel specific updates. And reader, viewer, and listener, please bear with me as when I tell you this, because first of all, the thing that jumped out at me in this set of updates was underwater camera mode and i was like oh oh what's gonna happen here underwater it turns out google partnered with a case maker called kraken kraken uh <laughs> okay unleash the kraken i think um, and yeah, uh, release and, uh, the kraken. yeah yeah and uh to make a case that is so you know powerful it will withstand deep water pressures which is a big deal the but then like the way it was worded google was like oh yeah, the camera will work natively with this case now. And I was like, can I slap another case on and still have the same experience? They were like, yeah, but like, uh, it, 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 this one's like going to be super clear. It's just basically mm -hmm. they had like a purpose made case made for the Pixel phones. That's it. Like it's a $300 plus <laughs> case that you can take deep sea diving and it will allow you to use the camera on the Pixel as like you like. That's Great. cool, but this is why action cameras so, exist, people. Come on. Yeah. Right. That and like cool slap on an IP68 friendly phone uh, case, I guess, or, or 3 ATM or 5 ATM and take it to those levels too. You'll be yeah. fine. Don't spend 300 plus dollars for a so called yeah. The GoPro this Hero is... 9 Black costs 350 you know, with the current discount. So, and it's not yeah. just a case. Jeez. Um, yeah. There you go. But uh, there are other updates coming to Pixels, one of which being Smart Compose coming to more messaging apps. Uh, previous, so Smart Compose is this thing where you, like, you type a few words and then Gmail or Google Docs would suggest ways to auto-complete that sentence. So like if I'm going like, hey, Davindra, and mm -hmm. then uh, Smart Compose will suggest what's up with the podcast or something. Like if it knows the context and if it knows what you typically would say. So... Um, this feature is coming to apps like Android Messages, Verizon Messages, Verizon's our parent company, by the way, um, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, some apps like that. So I guess it's about to get easier to type complete sentences on your phone. Yeah. And yeah, then <laughs> I feel like they've been trying to do this for a while. I don't know what's up. Uh, he's I, I'm an iPhone user. I feel like iOS uh, autocomplete has been getting dumber and dumber recently uh, too, so yeah i need some more mm -hmm. we need some more yeah. innovation around this that's, for sure that's that's probably because google knows so much about you but anyway um yeah, true. <laughs> right so there's a couple other features like um new wallpapers for international women's day um and some charging like when you're there's a new interface for when you put the pixel on the wireless charging stand and that sort of stuff somewhat small set of updates but if you combine it with the android updates we heard about last week we're getting a bunch of new features for Android phones and Pixels um, this this month, it seems like. So good news, I guess, for those of us on Android and Pixel. Good news from Google all around. Mm. Do we want to do a Q&A or should we just keep going? I think we could just barrel uh, through. Yeah, this I stuff think, won't take too long. Think, yeah. yeah. We should yeah. keep on going. Okay. I'll um, just I'll introduce and you could yeah. talk a bit about the Golden Globes. Like we don't need totally. to spend long on that. Yeah. I threw yeah. in a link to the square the square title stuff just because it is okay. Wild. You can take that. And that just dropped. Yeah. yeah, I'll just talk quickly about did that. We, but that's insane. Did we even want to talk about the rumored Nintendo Switch thing? Oh yeah, yeah. Let me just add a note to that. Okay. Thank Speaking you, of you. autocorrect things, um, I have found that uh, since I text people about radio so often that mm. sometimes when I uh, type in TA, it will autocomplete TAL for This American Life because I'm That's texting awesome. people about This American Life that often. Like, wow. How much of a nerd am I? <laughs> a super nerd. You're an audio nerd. We get it. <laughs> All right, I'm All right just so should we move thing. on? Yep, let me just add this good? Link, and okay. then I will throw, okay. <clears throat> um, for the video team, we're throwing links into the show notes, not the run of show yeah. doc, just so you know. Yep, okay. 
Let's move on to some other news real quick. Uh, over the weekend, the Golden Globes happened and uh, <laughs> entirely over Zoom and remote. And I haven't watched this entire thing, but by all reports, it is some kind of disaster. Oh, Sherlyn, wh what's up? I, okay, so generally I don't watch a lot of awards shows unless like some, one of my friends are throwing a watch party or something. Anyway, <laughs> um, they're usually fun if you're like there for the red carpet arrival and that, that sort of stuff. Obviously with the pandemic this year, this couldn't really happen. And so the Golden Globes was sort of a hybrid event. Um, and I feel like it was kind of similar to, was it the Oscars that happened fairly recently uh, during mm -hmm. the pandemic? It was somewhat similar in that it was also a hybrid event. Like there were people who took the stage to do it wasn't like the Oscars. narrations. We, we didn't have that yet. Um, oh, was uh, it was Oscar. another, uh, I can't remember which mm -hmm. award show it was, but there was an award show. I remember where like, anyway, um, <laughs> but it was similar in the sense that like you'd have one person on an actual stage and, and who was actually there. And then you had like these people zooming in, um video conferencing in so it was kind of a fun like way to look at what some of these celebrities and famous people and what their zoom setups were like and that like kind of went viral but also it was a complete mess like it just <laughs> there were like i think oh, daniel man. kaluuya when he was accepting his award for judas and the black messiah if i'm not wrong uh was, was on muted. mute was yeah. muted for a full like 30 seconds. And then when he finally came back or was brought back, he said, y'all played me dirty. And I was like, yeah, they yeah. Never did. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> and also like uh, the, what I saw was like, there were points where a lot of the nominees were just hanging out together in like a separate yeah. zoom room. And before commercials, like they would just go to that room without warning people like, Hey, by the way, you're on <laughs> camera now. So you would just <laughs> see random people just talking like a boring zoom conversation. It seemed like a complete disaster. I was just thinking about like, our uh, wonderful video team here at Verizon Media yes. is able to like manage our live yes. show every week so gracefully. Yes. And uh, these Golden Globes folks like just didn't think about a lot of aspects of how these shows, like what it would actually look like on TV and how it'd be presented. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you can watch this disaster on Hulu. It's right on now, Hulu. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's on Hulu. And it was, by the way, hosted by Tina Fey, Amy Poehler. Um, mm -hmm. I actually didn't watch it yet, so I don't know if they did a good job or not, but I'm sure they did. The The best <laughs> line, so though, yeah. mm -hmm. the best line that kind of went viral or made it into a meme anyway was like Tina Fey, I think, saying, couldn't this all have just been an email? And I'm like, 2020 vibes and 2021. <laughs> Absolutely true. Absolutely true. <laughs> and uh, yeah, worth pointing out, like this also follows like news from the LA Times about like the sheer corruption uh, in Yeesh. the Hollywood Foreign Press Association and all that. So go check out that reporting. It is not a great organization and the Golden Globes mm -hmm. are kind of a joke, but we still give it legitimacy every year. It is infuriating to me. Uh, let's talk about something that actually matters. It seems like mm -hmm. China and India are yeah. kind of uh, in conflict a bit yeah. especially china is kind of using its influence to um just kind of hint to india that uh hey we can we can use our malware to hurt your electrical grid so yeah. maybe maybe let's not fight as much uh what is going on there Sherlyn? so basically india and china have been involved in border skirmishes for a while and yeah, what yeah. happened i think in the last few months i can't remember the exact timeline but there were they, they got bad and there were like mm -hmm. a dozen people killed over these border skirmishes right around the time that happened uh parts of india started to see their their power go out um a a i believe bellevue seattle based uh uh, cybersecurity firm was looking into some of mm -hmm. that and noticed that there was basically malware in the Indian power grid uh, and it seemed to come from China. And so it was pretty crazy to think that like mm -hmm. a com country has control over another country's power grid. Like yeah, you think yeah. when, when I think it was like, Texas had a power out, not power outage, but like the winter storm destroyed it's everything. Imagine that being compounded by having some uh -huh. other country have control of yep. your power grid. Or being intact. That's insane. And this is this is something we've been talking about for a while. We talked about that yes. one Florida town where somebody did hack into the water, you know, purification system and they were able to catch this before they poisoned the water supply. But yeah. They, they, it was like a proof of concept. They proved that they could get into that water system. Mm -hmm. Um, this follows a lot of stuff too when it comes to cyber warfare. And we talked mm -hmm. about that, I think, last year, pre pandemic and everything. But this is how countries are kind of dealing with conflicts. And you could go back to Stuxnet 
in what uh, the U.S. government and Iran did um, or did with Iran's like nuclear program, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's all kind of all ties back together. I do think like we're starting to see the point where this stuff affects real people um, because yeah. China, this this uh, malware was affecting hospitals. It was affecting, you know, important things and important institutions during the middle of a pandemic. So mm. just somebody hacking into a power supply could risk lives, you know, and could cause so, further, yeah. yeah, injury to people. So it's, it's crazy. It, this is the world we're in, but I want to point out like, yeah, this stuff is happening. Uh, you may not hear yeah. about it as much compared to a lot yeah. of other things, but I hope we're thinking about our own like infrastructure and other countries are thinking about their, you know, infrastructure Total, security I, better. Yeah. To bring in a little bit of perspective here, like Singapore no. is freaking tiny. We're surrounded by water, but not potable water. And we have very few like lakes or anything, barely have a lake. We have reservoirs. <laughs> so we're actually super reliant on Malaysia, which was our farmer, like we used to be a part of Malaysia and we're no longer a part of Malaysia, but we we are super reliant on them for supply of drinking water, actually. Mm -hmm. So there's like giant pipes that run across what we call the causeway, which is this bridge that links the two together. And like the fear, the goal of the Singapore government has always to be like, no, we need to find an alternative source of water for our entire country because you cannot rely on another country for something as vital as your source of drinking water. And similarly, India mm -hmm. cannot afford to have China be infiltrating its power grid. So whether it's India needing to step up its cybersecurity and its, its privacy measures, or also China just needs to not be a dick. But th yeah. there's just so much here to there's really a lot think going about. On there. <laughs> yeah. There's just basically there's countries, <laughs> governments don't cannot use outdated tech base just stop using your outdated old using, super insecure tech <laughs> this is something we brought up before too and i do think like moving forward we need to start treating cyber like we need to start treating malware like this that can cause cyber attacks almost like nuclear weapons like there needs to be right. like more of a understanding and a broad um yeah a broad set of rules that every country kind of acknowledges when it comes to this stuff because just just a couple of people hitting buttons in China can lead to deaths in other country mm. and the same, the same, like that seems kind of crazy, crazy. to me. It, um, crazy. It, yeah, we, we are not prepared for kind of what all this stuff means. Mm. Uh, let's move on to another quick story that mm. I guess a big story that dropped this morning, right before our podcast <laughs> uh, square is buying a majority stake in title for the equivalent <laughs> of like $297 million in cash and stock. Let me say that again. Square, yeah, Square. the online like yeah payments processor, the company behind huh? Cash App, now owns huh. Title, the music service. I'm just very. There's a lot of like, huh, going on this morning. I woke up to this news. Uh, there's a photo of like Jack Dorsey and Jay Z in a <laughs> in like a dining room together with wine, and just like it's begging you to like just caption it of like what they're thinking Insane. of each other. Bomba clap, but. Yeah, yeah. So I think Dorsey is kind of positioning this as a way to like, you know, pay artists more directly. I don't, you know, this guy is just like a billionaire with his fingers in many pies at this point. And people talk about him like splitting his attention between Square and Twitter and not really <laughs> paying attention to Twitter. And this just seems like another thing that hmm. he's gonna be playing with. Um I don't know what this means. This is very strange to me. I have been thinking that like title as a standalone company probably can't stick around for too long just because oh, yeah. there is so much like Spotify has much more money. Like there's so much stronger competition and title is all about like high quality music from like a, uh, that's owned directly by a lot of artists. So yeah, they were trying for something very specific. I did not see this end coming, but uh, I yeah. don't know. Let's see I mean, uh, where it goes from here. Talking about paying artists and Jack Dorsey and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff, it reminds me of something we haven't yet talked about on this podcast, I think, which is uh -huh. the, the rumor or the testing of tipping on Twitter, um, sure. which sounds very much like what like Jack Dorsey seems to be trying <laughs> to do here with artists on music services like Tidal. Super so, followers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, uh, you, you know, you get rewarded for being on their platform by getting mm -hmm. money from these followers. So. Yeah. 
that's yeah, we <laughs> should talk about that at some point. Like that is like a fundamental, it does kind of go together. You're right. And it does. I don't of. like as a person in media, I'm not gonna be doing super followers or anything, but I think for a lot of mm. creators and artists, it could be a thing. It's an alternatives to like the newsletters that a lot of uh even journalists, like a lot of people are moving yeah. towards to get paid. I'm all about people getting paid, so that's fine. Don't yes. just produce yes. content for free on Twitter. Uh yes. But yeah, this, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the title thing. I don't <laughs> know what a lot of this means, but um, yeah, expect more commentary and stuff coming soon. I feel like everybody's spending their morning just wrapping their heads around this news. So, yeah. yeah. Do you have anything to add on this, Sherlyn? No, not on this, but I know that there's a bit of news that broke last night, too, after we were done planning this uh, episode that got me a little bit stoked. I don't know if I'm stoked or not yet, um, yeah. but Dev, do you want to tell people what it is? Sure. Like, so there have been rumors that Nintendo is working on a more powerful or larger Switch. And yes. I feel like it is coming into fruition right now because Bloomberg reported last night that Nintendo has begun production of a Switch with a 7-inch OLED screen. Ooh. Samsung is producing the screens. Um, we don't have many details about the hardware. It sounds like it's still going to be 720p in portable mode. Mm -hmm. But that OLED screen means things are going to look a lot better. Colors are going to pop more. Uh, there's going to be a lot better contrast. And yes. certainly daylight play is going to be better. It should use less energy. Um, but the other kicker is that when it's docked, it should output 4K, which yes. raises a lot of questions. I don't think, like, I, I feel like this can't be the Switch 2 or something, right? I don't think Pro. Nintendo is going to bifurcate. Yeah, well, Switch 2 would mean a full sequel, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think we're there. It is probably yeah. something more like a Switch Pro or the name I'd like to see, the Super Switch. Um, like a slightly more powerful, slightly more modern, you know, device that still plays all the existing Switch games. And I don't think Nintendo is going to leave the Switch hardware behind anytime soon. Like developers will still have to target the original Switch that was released right. what, five years ago at this point. Right. Um, so we're kind of getting there. Um, or four years ago, I guess. Uh, it is getting a little old, but... I think as a platform, it's very healthy. Like there are still great games coming out. Um, graphically, sure, it can't keep up with the PS5 and Xbox mm -hmm. Series X, but that's never been the point of the Switch. And I don't think Nintendo has to play that game. Maybe for that 4K docked functionality, that could have slightly better upscaling than what the Switch yeah. has now. Because actually there are a couple companies that are basically producing these little dongles that attach to mm -hmm. the Switch's HDMI port to kind of sharpen the graphics just like add a little better upscaling so me i could see that being a thing I, certainly i cannot imagine a switch powering a like an actual 4k rendered game that seems ridiculous um at the very i feel like nintendo just needs to target 1080p a smooth like solid 60 fps if they can manage that then that's gonna be great for anybody and you can upscale that to 4k just fine do you are you thinking of upgrading at this point Trillin? like what are you so excited about here I, I uh, still am not very sure if this is a 4K TV, to be honest, that I have over here in my house, even though it's a new one. I think it's a 1080p uh, LED. It depends on um, how old it is, but yeah, we can we can always old. Google your your model number and we'll pretty, see. Pretty, pretty old. Uh, it's pretty, pretty 1080p, pretty sure. Uh, but, but so for <laughs> me, functionally, that would be a useless upgrade. Yeah. And also, I haven't traveled with my Switch a lot back when mm -hmm. I first got it oh god at the start of 2020 mm -hmm. um i was planning to travel with it and then in those cases the seven inch oled would make a difference mm -hmm. right now though i'm not so sure i i don't know if i'm gonna get one the second it comes out yet but it's exciting mm -hmm. just because you know of all the console <laughs> sort of consoles the this is the love. one that i have yeah yeah <laughs> i love yeah. it <laughs> i get it i get it it's, it's kind of i mean having i feel like i just reviewed the switch Lite. you know that doesn't feel like it was that long ago so if it ends up being a portable device that is maybe slightly bigger than the Switch Lite, but not as chunky as the original yeah. Switch, like with slimmer bezels and that OLED screen, I do feel like people are going to jump on that. It does remind me of like um, the long lost PS Vita. Uh, that console was amazing. It had a beautiful OLED screen and I'm still sad Sony <laughs> killed that. So that felt like our, our precursor to the Switch almost because yeah. that was such a powerful, good looking console. Um, but yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on this. Maybe we'll have a new Switch soon. Let's move on to what we've been working on. Um, I can't wait. Just just a bunch of stuff. This week has been super busy for me. So I, I covered the Microsoft Mesh News. Go check out my reporting around that. I am working on a gadget 
piece and uh, something we called an IRL about how we live mm -hmm. with devices uh, around the Arlo cameras, specifically the Arlo video doorbell and um, some of the outdoor cameras. So that's going to be a quick thing. Uh, I found that to be super useful around my home because I didn't mm -hmm. want ring cameras. And I'm um, also going to be working on a list of like things you can buy if you've just picked up a new OLED TV. Sherlyn, what's up with you? Uh, I have been working on, so fair warning to my friends who are always uh, looking for secrets. There will be a lot of stuff coming up. Let's just put this out there. Y'all are going to be excited. There are gadgets. Know. Gadgets are there coming. There are yeah. gadgets. But right now we're still in a half lull, half like I can do whatever I want. Um, so a very interesting product was announced this week. I can finally talk about it. The Gatorade GX Sweat Patch. It was announced on Monday. I have been testing it for a few days. And uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy. I have I, questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, Devinder, tell me your questions first. I mean, what what the hell is this? Why would I want <laughs> a patch from Gatorade on my skin? Like, this feels yes. like a idiocracy joke. You know, it feels like uh, yeah. it's just something to tell you you need more electrolytes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It weird as heck. It is weird. And uh, Gatorade, right? Yeah. They want to get you to be drinking more of their juice punch things. So sugar water. They made yeah. yeah. Sugar water, electrolyte patch, whatever. So basically, they made this patch that you stick on your inner forearm. It's like a, I don't even bigger than most coins, but small, like, yeah, it's that, okay. that's an almost thumb it's size a, patch. A big square band aid almost. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like a big square band-aid. And then you stick it on your skin, and there's a dye uh, pack on the underside <laughs> that uh -huh. uh, as you sweat, it will fill up the patch okay. and show, like, how much you've sweat and, like, what the composition of your sweat is to know if you, you know, how much you need to hydrate back and what your body's sodium uh, output or mm -hmm. loss is. So it's, it's kind of like a UX. It's UI for your water loss, <laughs> which I feel like is just sweat literally yeah. sweat like nature's ui so <laughs> for telling us we need more water is to sweat yeah yeah it's uh it's a, yeah. your notification your alert right here's mm -hmm. here's the issue which is i for for this story i have received four patches to test <laughs> one of them just did not work because uh -huh. i am not a sweaty person i just uh I'm all flowers and fresh air. Yeah. I just until don't really to, sweat that much. Until we go to Taiwan for compies or, or compies. Yeah, and then that's yeah. like freaking, yeah. oh it's my God. Sweat. Maybe because yeah. I grew up in Singapore and that's yeah. what I'm used to and that's what mm -hmm. when I will sweat. So I don't sweat yeah, a lot. You should have gone to a sauna. You must have a sauna in your fancy apartment building. I wish. I wish. <laughs> I wish I could have said that I could be bougie enough to be like, I have a sauna. So no. So I um had to do a lot of like studies i i like did a lot of looking up like what causes difference in sweating between people and and mm -hmm. climate and stuff like that so yes men generally tend to sweat more than women do um you obviously sweat in more in warmer temperatures and more like the different climates and then you know depending on the activity so according to gatorade this patch will only work if outside if the temperature is between 46 and like 75 degrees which like, i don't what? know why there's an upper limit useless there shouldn't. yeah be, yeah. yeah that doesn't make sense but i'm not gonna question that too much because we didn't hit 75 here in the new york area um yeah. but i was working out at the gym for like an hour and a half and my gym's like between that like within that range and i just did not sweat enough i literally i took a photo of it and it was like <laughs> sorry no data b word Work and harder. i was like yeah they were like yeah Shoot, I was like telling our editor, I was like, this first patch to work, he was like, work harder. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I just don't sweat a lot. Um, so the second time I tried to test it, I had to bump up my apartment temperature to like the highest my thermostat would go. Would and it. like, yeah, yeah, it was sort of. And then I started working out at home and mm -hmm. I did, I just, listener, viewer, all of you, swear to God, I did like, what did I do? I did like, okay, a few like um, Oculus <laughs> to um, Supernatural workouts, which mm -hmm. in the past usually makes me sweat a lot. I uh, sweat was pouring down my face, my neck, my back, but not my inner forearm. I don't sweat on my inner forearm. I'm very so, confused about it. Are these things one-time use? Like how often yes. are you switching these up? Okay. 
So every time you use them, you dis- they're disposable. You dispose of them. So the I, I managed yeah. to get a result finally after doing a hit workout, which I hate. I hate hit, but I did a hit workout uh-huh. in my burning high apartment. intensity training workout. High intensity high intensity interval training. Mm-hmm. Yes. So mm-hmm. um, finally got some results, but I still basically don't sweat a lot. So y'all are gonna get a very sweaty video from me soon enough. I'm going to test it again today for a video. Yeah. Stay tuned for that. Let me it will just be, say yeah. for the record, I hate this. And I feel like this thing should burn in a fire because what? It, yeah, this is exactly what we need. Disposable tech from Gatorade to tell you to drink more Gatorade. This is everything that's wrong with us right now. It's a, it's a good line yeah. I shall use in my in my article yeah. later later today. Um, but anyway, that's coming. I'm working on that and a bunch of other stuff that's coming up that I can't talk about just yet. So stay tuned okay. for all of that. Very cool. Well, let me give you a break, Trillin, so you can catch your breath and uh, <laughs> switch your Gatorade patches. Let's move on to our pop culture picks. <laughs> I'll talk about what I've been watching. Uh, One thing I think everybody should see is the Billie Eilish documentary (laughs) that is on Apple TV Plus right now. It's called The World's a Little Blurry. This thing is two and a half hours long. It is so long, it actually has an intermission in the middle, uh, which is pretty wild. But it's a documentary (laughs) that looks at Billie Eilish's career kind of from as she was becoming popular and before um, she, like as she was working on Bad Guy at the beginning and then post Grammys, post like her super popularity and kind of cuts between early and later Billie Eilish. And I love her music. I love like the work relationship she has with her brother Phineas. Um, it's a really, just if you dig her music, I think you'll find a lot to like here. I think it is a good enough documentary to really get more people into her stuff. And um, I just want to say, I really like her family. It's really it's really cute because she travels, you know, she tours with her mom and her dad and they're all like very supportive and very earnest and very like emotionally aware, which is something we don't typically see with very young, successful pop artists. Right. Like either the parents are too demanding or the parents are like absent and then they have terrible Mm -hmm. people around them. But it kind of seems like, you know, I don't I think they're probably just still living in the same old like tiny house that she grew up in 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 L.A. Um, It's all very modest, like uh, they're very like. I don't know. They, they seem like a nice family, just like a very sweet family. Uh, they were both homeschooled, both she and her brother. So they never actually mm-hmm. went to real school. So her parents like clearly made some choices for them along those lines. But this is, at least seems like a sweet story of a family dealing with their daughter becoming a super huge, tremendous pop star and how she deals with that. Um, I, there's a moment I'm here. Cur- yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, I'm curious if you've watched any of the other recent celebrity documentaries, like the Paris Hilton one, the Britney Spears no. one. I, saw uh, a bit I was going to see Spears how that one. compared. Yeah. I saw yeah. a bit of the Britney Spears one. That one is more about deconstructing like how we treated Britney Spears. The media, like, yeah. Billie Eilish is on the rise. What you know? How is this affecting her? So it's more personal, mm-hmm. I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's more hopeful because the Britney Spears one also just made me really sad about our media culture. Yeah. Um, We'll say like there, there are a couple of points during this movie where it's just like you start to realize how young Billie Eilish is. Like at some point she runs into Orlando Bloom, who just like, you know, meets her and says, oh, I love your work and everything. And he kisses her. And later she's like, who's that? Oh, no. And then, uh, people like to be like, and then people like to be like, oh, he was the guy in Pirates of the Caribbean. And uh, she's like, oh, oh why, doesn't he, why doesn't he look like that anymore? Just like absolutely dragging these stars. Um yeah, yeah, it's kind of she, she. She was really excited to see Justin Bieber, though. Oh like, man, uh, that's the Justin the world Bieber she moment, in. which is I. Yeah, not a, I'm not a huge Justin Bieber fan. I don't know really too many young, you know, teens or tweens that mm-hmm. are. But she was somebody who was obsessed with him she to the was. point where, like, she would fantasize about him being her boyfriend. So <laughs> there's a section in the middle of this movie where she meets Justin Bieber for the first time. Just the way she like falls apart, just like it is pure, just bawling into her arms, and like he is he comes across as a pretty good guy and it's like he's pretty sweet and supportive and gives her support as like i know what you're going through you've never like this is world changing and everything like he's there to kind of step her along the way it's all very sweet stuff like that and i'm hoping for the best for billy eilish and uh and her family because yeah i feel like bad things tend to happen to young stars when they get mm-hmm. super popular really quickly i'm thinking of like amy winehouse and a lot of other mm-hmm. folks and this does not seem like that story so yeah, it's great. Check out this documentary. It's on Apple TV Plus right now. And I also want to mention, uh, just real quick, Lee Isaac Chung's movie Minari mm-hmm. is out on video on demand. Uh, we just reviewed it on the Slash Filmcast. It's about uh, a Korean family who immigrates to America, uh, you know, with the dream of starting a farm. 
in Arkansas. And it is a film that's a, very much about like the immigrant dream, the American dream, and also, yeah, very specifically about Asian families coming here and dealing with a country that finds them all very, very different and uh, out of sorts with the rest of America. I found it really lovely. Um, like I found a lot to uh, relate to as well because I immigrated to this country with my family. Uh, our experiences are very similar. Um, not the farming thing, but also just feeling out of sorts in America. This movie also has a great performance from Steven Yeun, who mm -hmm. I think I I love. I love as an actor. It's also really weird to go from a movie like Burning, where he plays like a elite sociopath, like just like an <laughs> upper crusty psychopath in a way, um, but quietly a psychopath, to this movie where he is just like a good, like a dad, like a good immigrant dad with like immigrant dad energy. He's very sweet. He's kind of tough at times. Like it, it, like it goes places like the marriage is not fully together because of the struggles of immigrating to America and just surviving here. So I highly recommend it. Um, I think this is one of those $20 rentals right now, but if you've got the money, if you haven't spent much on movies, you know, over the past year, it is worth checking out. Uh, it's a very sweet film. It's called Minari. Sherlyn, what have you been watching? I uh, have been spending the last few days, I guess, catching up on old stuff. So don't have fresh stuff by way of recommendations um, okay. for you guys. But, but, but I did set aside two things. So I've also been going a little crazy ham on Duolingo. <laughs> because okay. I decided to hey, the hey, productive gamifying. Yes, uh, good exactly. For you, good for you. Uh, yeah. So instead of learning just one language at a time, like most normal people, I am currently learning three. I've oh made like a bunch of progress in Spanish. So I'm like, all right, I'm, uh, I need a bit of a challenge. So I decided to re-up my Japanese. And so like mm -hmm. I'm back on Japanese. And also I started to learn Korean. And Korean, I know people say or think it's easy. Like, gosh, it's hella hard to learn Korean. It's <laughs> ridiculous. I thought you were going to be like, the, I need to go French next and just do all the really hard languages all together. Like, oh, you're really going to test yourself. Yeah. I was very lucky to grow up l having like being just fluent in Mandarin, which is one mm -hmm. of the most difficult languages to mm -hmm. learn. But anyway, so Korean. And then I, I re-upped my Bahasa, which is uh, Indonesian. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting to see how dual. And then also for fun, I decided to take on Chinese because I wanted to be like, Duolingo, you're wrong. That's not how Chinese people say this thing. And and um, But uh, never... It, it, Duolingo yeah. definitely teaches you awkward ways to say things. Let's just put it that way. But it is still a good way to familiarize yourself with like all these basics of a language. Um, I feel confident if I were to go to Spain again for MWC <laughs> that I can get around just fine. Oh, nice. And yeah, and so I, I mean, I know we're not going anywhere yet, but we are soon. You're, you're ready to go soon. everywhere. You're ready to go yeah. from Spain to Japan to Korea yes. and then back home to Indonesia. Amazing. Yeah. So so. Yeah. I, why not? Why not pick up a language now? You got like about a uh -huh. few, quite a few months left to pick up a new language. There's <laughs> leaderboards. I'm at the top of my leaderboard right now because I am You're really a crazy channeling person. your overachieving uh, school energy here. So I totally. love it. Totally. Love to see it. Um, uh, anything the, else? Really? Yes. One more thing, which is I wanted to let you help relax. Um, uh -huh. YouTube recommended this to me last night, which is how I came across this. This is called. Uh, a, a channel called The Icing Artist. And it's basically this woman who is really good at decorating cakes and cookies and other pastries. And it's so therapeutic in a way that like, <laughs> it's art. It's just art, right? And it's not like a TikTok video where it's over in, I don't know, under a minute. This is like a full on 10 minute video where she's just like putting the finishing touches or like just taking a cake that's so basic and then making it look like i don't know legos or whatever i i, I first watched the series of her turning 20 dollars grocery store cakes into 500 hundred dollar wedding cakes and i'm just like what did you know you could stuff flowers into a cake to upgrade the hell out of them no i did not know this uh -huh. you could gold leaf onto a cake i just anyway it was it was you're really very, it's very also nice. like the uh the everything is cake meme you're just like really leaning exactly. to that now yeah, exactly. So, so this, cake. yeah, when you're not hungry, when you're like, you know, on a full stomach, and you're just wanting to relax and, you know, just watch some art. And she's really cool. She's not like, there's a whole like process to her to how she does all of these things. It's not just like a competition baking show thing. It's really just for you to watch how a cake mm -hmm. 
gets decorated. Um, I, I found that very therapeutic. So enjoy the icing artist on YouTube. All right. Why don't you take us take us out when you're ready? Yep. Get us into the outro. All righty. Well, that's it for our episode Actually, this week, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I hear police. Byron. Yeah. <laughs> that might have been Let's, me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, still me. Well, yeah, because I you're think they're the, done now. Yeah, you're the one who's closest to like large police mm -hmm. or like cr crowded streets. Yeah, we have drag racers in my neighborhood, but you can't hear <laughs> them. So. Yeah, that's because there's usually, like a large highway next to us. That's usually yeah. after midnight, though, right? Yeah. Oh. All right. But I am now that it's quiet, it. let's it. do it. Okay. Well, that's it for our episode this week, everyone. Thank you, as always, for listening. Our theme music is by game composer Dale North. Our outro music is by our very own Terrence O'Brien. This podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find Davindra online at at Devendra on Twitter and chatting about movies and TV on the slash film cast at slash film.com. I was also on Twit this week chatting about all sorts of stuff. So check that out at twit.tv. If you want to test me on the five to seven languages I'm currently learning, you can hit me up. I'm at Sherlyn Lowe on Twitter. Email us at podcastandgadget.com. Leave us a review, please, on iTunes and subscribe on anything that gets podcasts, including Spotify. Okay, Ooh. we're done. So, Q &A? Chatter, yeah, Chatter, Q &A. if you want to ask anything about, I mean, we don't have uh, our additional uh, <laughs> VR AR expert uh, so much anymore, but um, it's a good oh, Emma to ask us anything. Yeah, yeah, ask, yeah, ask us, ask us anything if you want to know about. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't know, third party cookies or something. If you want to know about Nintendo Switch, um, we have everything. We have all our headsets. Oh yeah. So is, is that <laughs> the actual thing that you got for? This is the Hololens too, but I can't put it on over these headphones. But it kind of looks like this. So as Oculus you're wearing Quest it. Quest too. And I see everything. I should have just done the entire episode like this. That would have been cool, but not great for video. I really like the pass through cameras on the Quest 2. So, by the way. yeah, Quest 2 is pretty the, hot. The HoloLens, mm -hmm. does it come with, does it have like uh, headphones built in or? Yep. Has like, yeah. not like, yeah, it has like m small headphones. It gives you like really good situational audio because like you can get a good sense. We didn't talk about this as we were doing the demo, but like as I was sitting here, I could tell that like Joanna Stern was over here on my right and other okay. people were over here. And there was somebody oh, cool. who, who like tuned in behind me mm -hmm. and I felt like, there was audio right oh, behind me, which is really, yeah, really strange. Cool. Facial, that's so, awesome. Like, it, because yeah. it's relatively easy to do like situational audio and figure out, okay, if this person is to your left, then mm -hmm. pan this left. And so the sound would be maybe like 80% mm -hmm. in your left ear. Twenty. But it has to do it like right. in real time as these yeah. like augmented reality holograms are floating around your house. Like it is, there's a lot going on there. I really dig it. By the way, uh, <laughs> I, I I'm seeing this mentioned in the comment uh, in the in the chat, and I also wanted to bring up. Uh, yeah, we are aware of an account that looks like us. Mm. Um, there have been several now. It looks like one account appeared in the chat bearing the name oh, no. Engadget with something that is not our logo. But there is another account going around commenting on our review videos uh, that looks exactly like our account, but it's not us. And we've reported mm. it to YouTube. We're just waiting on them to take action. Right we would now, never comment on our own review videos. Come on. <laughs> we <laughs> with we might personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so D-Man asks, like, okay, it, the question is, should I use any Google products because I don't use uh, I don't use anything other than Gmail and Search. So I think I want to refine mm -hmm. that and maybe say, if you were to sell someone on an additional thing other than Gmail and Search, which is <laughs> actually what a lot of people yep. uh, stop at, what is the next thing that you would I mean, to sell them on? I think Drive and the Office stuff is good. Like I, just okay. the usefulness would, of Google Drive. Yeah. Docs, oh, yeah. like, I would, I yeah. would consider All the Drive docs. to be maybe uh, like under the Gmail umbrella. I don't know. Maybe that's... No, it's it's a very, no, like a lot of people different. don't know it's all very separate. Right. But yeah, doc, so what I mean is like everything including Drive. Totally. So I mean the storage, but I also yep. mean the Office apps like Docs and Sheets and everything. It is the best way to collaborate on anything. Yep. It's how we prepare our show notes. Like that's how I've yep. worked ever since they've yep. like existed. Calendar you know? also very good calendar yeah yeah all the essentials all of yeah. their productivity software is surprisingly just really good the, the reason mm -hmm. i like was trying to so-called correct you dev is because when you, you keep saying office apps and i'm like office is a microsoft name but yes basically no the we call Google them off, equivalent. Yeah, office yeah. yeah equivalent office apps basically yeah, yeah. 
Um, what other Google oh, products so... might I might I recommend? Uh-huh. I mean, Android. A lot of people use it. It's good, and for a lot it's, of it's reasons. Thing. YouTube. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. YouTube is very good, and also. I would highly recommend people, if you spend enough time on YouTube, pay for that premium subscription. Mm-hmm, it will change mm-hmm. your life. Like, just not having ads, not having ads, not we got a, the garbage. We got a hell yeah, yeah from uh, our video team. Hell yeah like, from Julio, yep. <laughs> I didn't expect it. I didn't, like, I tested it out, uh, like, last mm-hmm. year at some point. And then I just, like, kept it going because I'm like, this is good. This is just, like, pure unfiltered internet video. Stick, you know, stick it right into my veins with no ads, like getting it the way. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty solid. Yeah. I miss those days. So yeah. I saw something in the chat about Firefox. And uh, did you guys know that I have used Firefox throughout? So like, it, you know, I started when it was, you know, mm-hmm. a hot thing in the late 2010s. And then... Post Mozilla. Yeah. No, well... it, it was hot, like in the early 2010s. Like it was like yeah. after like Mozilla transitioned into Firefox. Yeah. Like the successor I loved to using Navigator. Firefox way back okay. when. Yeah. Back then it was amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. and so I started, I started around then. And then mm-hmm. when Chrome happened, I was just being obstinate really i was just like i'm happy with my current experience i don't see right. you don't need to change yeah. it took me a while to do that too yeah. um then uh <laughs> everyone started complaining about how much of a resource hog chrome was and i was like ha i've i feel vindicated by this no. and um they've done a, a good amount of work on uh, firefox it runs pretty snappily right now and i like the fact that um, it has the container tabs and stuff like that. Um, again, like, what do you mean by somewhat... container tabs? Like everything is individual because Chrome well, does that too. Uh, well, yeah. no, it's it's that um, you can run things in a specific tab that does not collect cookies. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, you can kind of do. Yeah, you can you do incognito? that. It's like a private, yeah, incognito tab. Like every what? browser does that right now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can have incognito on Firefox, of course, mm-hmm. but um, but you mean like a very like even more granular settings. Yeah, I think yeah. Edge, and... Microsoft has started adding more stuff like that to Edge. I will say, like it, the only vindication there, Ben, is that is that Chrome became basically an OS and a platform on its own. So people started building in all this other stuff, and like yeah. you get bogged down by being the most popular thing. That's what I, happened to I... IE. Firefox was was super janky yes. even when it was super popular yeah yeah i'll say this the the thing for me that chrome has going for it is the ability to just sign into your gmail and have yeah. like everything put everything in so quickly yeah. everything mm-hmm. all your bookmarks all your history everything and yes that's part of the whole like they have all your info thing but i enjoy the convenience it brings you choose with it. Firefox, yeah yeah mm-hmm. with firefox you can still sign into the thing but like it's not as easy as like you i'm already a big gmail and drive user i only need one yeah. sign in to then be logged mm-hmm. into so many things and then you get your Firefox, credit card info through google like right, through google pay exactly. and everything too. like that's and then it syncs with yeah. your apps on your phone so like there's just so mm-hmm. many tie-ins that make things uh, easier when you use chrome whereas if firefox is good because yes in some ways it's better for your privacy than chrome firefox mm-hmm. has a lot of similar features i think chrome though was one of the first mm-hmm. to do like apps and extensions for browsers yeah. too, right i know firefox well, had extensions for a while they but... turned their like google's extensions were like legit mini programs like that's yes, how exactly. chrome has be, kind of exactly. became a thing is because it was such a powerful browser uh I'll yeah. say, folks like run multiple browsers you can feel free yes. to do that and yeah, actually totally that's how i manage having two separate email accounts uh like yeah. my personal email everything i send on personal is on g is on chrome and i know that's there everything yeah. i do on work is on edge and yeah. having those two separate like things is really it's helpful better. too yeah, yeah that's what i've been thinking about doing you know uh like firefox could be my personal browser and mm-hmm. brave could be my uh sure. browser or something uh, well, don't forget opera i uh <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so uh, similarly someone's asking it like is firefox dead like edge then a bunch of people in the comments came edge out and said dead. edge isn't dead edge isn't dead <laughs> Edge is powered by edge chromium now and yeah, yeah. Uh, kumar vishal points out google's chrome v8 engine is revolution yeah they've had a lot of big leaps like that and i'll tell you it really depends on your system too like using chrome on one of apple's m1 systems is like amazing it is mm-hmm. life-changing but that's true of any browser because the m1 is just so fast but it, yeah it is crazy to see like what better processors and new tech can do for all of our browsing experiences too it's almost instant you know Spe- speaking of that i mean resource hogging and stuff like that uh our our video director asks <laughs> or made a joke ram colon am i a joke to you 
<laughs> AKA is. yes, RAM hogging is sometimes hogging. an issue with Chrome. I've got 32 um, gigabytes of RAM and things still eat up all my RAM. Oh, so geez. yeah. Um, but I wanted to thank all the people that are in the chat, by the way, not that I'm trying to hurry us or anything, but yeah, we've got okay. a lot of like familiar names. We got, of course, Mark and D-Man. Uh, as usual, Nathania has been around. We saw, uh, I think, Joan Osorio earlier today. Julio Barrientos. <laughs> he's, I'm kidding. He's participating in the chat now, which is fun. The Twilight Zone is hey, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kea Sante. It's like shouting out names so y'all know that we see you. And yeah, we I forgot to tweet you. out the episode today, actually. So everybody who came in came in organically. So yeah. good job, everybody. Thank you. Devin Caswell, Halid Sully. Uh, I am a, I am sapient. So I'm ooh, seeing... Ooh. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go on. I was going to read the Chinese name, but this is uh, traditional characters, not simple. So I'm going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so while... Uh... Sherlyn is trying to um, be... Looks like Tanjin one or something, <laughs> so let's continue. Yes, while, while Sherlyn is trying to parse uh, the traditional Chinese, I saw something in the chats. Uh, someone named Pipsta said uh, that they use Brave based off mm -hmm. of Chrome, yes, can mm -hmm. earn cryptocurrency for doing this, and then mm -hmm. double it up using Generate and Peach, which are... Um, browser add-ons peach ubi which i just looked up it's a conditional ubi system based on the attention economy for everyone on the internet um and they said that they make uh five to ten pounds a day just for browsing the internet uh but what about privacy i'd like to know some things about privacy hmm on, uh, on Brave, you were saying, or well, I mean, if you're using Peach UBI, it seems like you would okay. um, be giving a lot of your like browsing history to this other. Yeah, anything. Yeah, I don't know exactly. Anything third computers. party is a little iffy like that. I don't know mm -hmm. the UBI at all, um, so I probably couldn't answer this question, Pipsta. Or sorry, conditional universal basic income. I have no idea what this is. What? So it's like making money for browsing the web, basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, and so like a conditional UBI, I think that's really just like mm -hmm. jumping on the concept of universal mm -hmm. basic income. Conditional mm -hmm. universal basic income is actually not like that's a contradiction of terms yeah universal yeah. basic income is un is supposed to be unconditional peach is a i'm looking at their website peach is a for-profit company we do make money from ads and we think that is important so i just that yeah i don't sound... know i haven't done enough research about what this is but yeah. I, anything you plug in like people use a lot of the uh the coupon extensions too, to get deals and discount like honey yeah. like they're taking a ton of information so you're basically saying i'm okay with that and some people are that's fine take those discounts do whatever but sometimes being more private being more data secure co will cost you money too because yes. yeah discounts come from taking because you don't data. get the ads that that offset yep. those prices yes yep and if you're using anything that mines bitcoin or any kind of cryptocurrency that means that you are just giving up your uh, processing power and being like yes please use this yeah. and also watch your power bill like those things go crazy like that's the thing um I think one thing holding back crypto mining is just like how power intensive it is or all these studies about like the amount of power that Bitcoin, you know, uh, mining is generating and taking up when we're in the middle of a pandemic and a climate crisis and the world is on fire and we're spending our energy making fake money. I'm just very... I cannot like process that. I'm not a fan of that. Remember yeah. some number of years ago when people were instead of tossing their extra um processing power to like cryptocurrency or sure. whatever else they were all doing protein folding everyone yeah. was doing protein folding protein folding or steady at home like there there there's a bunch of stuff like when i used to i used to run a computer lab in college and right after college and there were like 50 machines i could just do whatever i wanted on them right so i set up a script to just like run folding at home when they're when nobody's on them like just for extra downtime and that sort of stuff is useful like you use collective processing for universal good not for goddamn fake money you yeah. know yeah all and right I so think, um yeah. sorry yeah, we're, we're kind no, of running out of time so yeah, yeah, yeah. i just wanted to make sure we, we 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 looked at some other things uh i think i saw one and then i lost it um mm -hmm. <sighs> 
Someone asked if there was Zoom limits on a Chromebook. Dev, any experience there? What do you mean Zoom limits? I mean, it depends on I, your Zoom account, but I Chromebooks are fine for Zoom. Make sure you get one with like a decent webcam, you know, and decent, like, I don't know how you can really test the wireless functionality, but I've definitely seen mm -hmm. like some cheaper ones will have less, you know, less wireless antennas, less strong Wi-Fi. So depending on where you are, it's going to be less good at connectivity. So you got to take all those into account. But if you're that was, um, just being like, stupid and thinking yeah, like, was, oh yeah, there are Zoom limits on free accounts. You can only do forty minutes. That's like what everyone. I, I, yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> that too. That, that too. Yeah. Think about your account. Yeah. So that was Joe Wilder asking that question, um, and then just a comment from Mark saying uh, he's so happy to see Internet Explorer eleven usage drop <laughs> over time as a web developer. That's great. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much all the time we have yeah, for today. Um, we, we actually thanks, everyone. have to get to the business of creating internet. This is only partially creating internet. So thank you, everyone. Let's thank you. Let me let me do my credits for the video team. This stream comes to you via our video team, which is led by Kyle Mock with Owen Davidoff, Julio Barrientos, and Luke Brooks. But it's powered by everyone in the chat. Really, thank you to people like D-Man and Mark Dell and Kay Asante. It, like, the people in the chat are what make doing this really, really fun. For sure. Um, if you stuck around this long and there are some new people who've stuck around this long, rate the show on iTunes. We all live in a world of algorithms. Please subscribe. Helps, subscribe yeah. and rate. Yeah. It, it helps way more than you think. So mm -hmm. we'll see you next week. See you, folks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> dog, 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 dog.